It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? There's marshmallows for toasting and something for roasting and caroling out in the sleigh. I don't know. Uh, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock, uh, rocking around the clock. I don't know. Uh, I love Christmas though, man. Oh, Christmas music, I think is some of the best, right? Best Christmas song out there, White Christmas, Bing Crosby, right? Come on, somebody. Also, one of the best Christmas films out there, White Christmas, Bing Crosby, okay? Love it. So good. If you're, uh, if you're as old as I am and you've never seen that movie, your parents hated you as a child, all right? <laughs> Just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't know that for sure because I don't know your parents. Um, but I love Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. The snow, I love snow. I'm one of those people, okay? I want 30 inches of snow before Christmas morning. Yeah. <laughs> Dear God, let it snow. I'll take all the booze. I don't care. See, this beard, it was created for snow, all right? I want the snow. I love the movies. I love the music, right? I love all the old movies. I love the new ones, too, like Frozen and Home Alone. They just came out with a brand new Home Alone on Disney, all right? I'm excited for it. I'm really excited for it. Uh, Christmas time is the best time of the year, celebrations, hanging out with family around the Christmas tree, opening up presents. That is one of the best moments, uh, uh, traditions for me. I love it so much. I believe, uh, why, why is Christmas the best time of the year? Because I believe that it is. I believe Christmas is the best time of the year. And I think that I'm not the only person who believes that. Because if you drive around neighborhoods, you see people with Christmas trees in their windows or in their yards. Or you see Christmas lights around their house and decorations. People love Christmas time. Why though? Why do people, I mean obviously for us we understand why we love Christmas, right? But why do other people who don't know Jesus love Christmas? Why? I believe I believe that's because at this time of the year, every year, there is a supernatural peace, hope, and joy that falls on all people and softens their hearts and opens up their lives to love. I believe that. You know why I believe that? Because I love Christmas movies and I watch all of them. I watch uh, all the ones that come out on Hallmark every year, you know, the super cheesy ones, right? <laughs> right? I watched the ones that are on Netflix like yesterday. I just watched a brand new one on Netflix. It was fantastic. And there was the quote, this quote at the end of the movie, the very end of the movie, my wife started to cry when, it, when, when this person said it. It said this, the darkest nights will end. The sun will rise again. And Christmas mornings will come when anything can happen. That's hope. That's hope. In a, in a Christmas movie that had nothing to do with Jesus, there was hope. Why? Because people are looking for hope. People are looking for peace. People are looking for joy. That's why Christmas time is the best time of the year because people have come up with stories to try to explain why there's hope, to try to explain why there's joy. But friends, we know the truth, don't we? We know who it is that brings joy and we know exactly what the truth is. We know that there was a boy named Jesus who was born on Christmas, who grew up to be a man, who sacrificed his life for us so that we could know the hope and love and peace of a supernatural God who created us. Come on. Do you know what that means? That means if we are carriers of the truth, if we are carriers of the gospel, if we are carriers of the hope of Jesus Christ, we have an amazing open door of opportunity during Christmas to share the love and the good news of Jesus. Because it's during this season every year that every person I believe is open. They're open to hearing a story of hope. They're open to hearing a story of joy. And we know the one person who can sustain peace, who can sustain hope, who can sustain joy far past a season. Are you with me this morning? Amen. So we're gonna start a new series this today throughout this Christmas season called Gift Exchange. Why? Because the gift exchange is the best part of Christmas, right? Right? Come on, guys. <laughs> Giving gifts and getting gifts, best part of Christmas. I remember those are some of the fondest memories of waking up early Christmas morning and running into my parents' bedroom and jumping on my dad, right? Elbow to the gut, waking him up. It's time for Christmas, bruh. 
and him throwing me off the bed said, I wish you, oh boy. You know what I'm saying? Gift exchange is the best part of Christmas, seeing joy on, on kids' faces or loved ones' faces when we give them a gift and they open it and that's just pure joy to receive, and, uh, to receive a gift from a generous giver, right? That's why Jesus taught on generosity because generosity brings joy. That's another message. I'm not preaching that today. Today I'm preaching on gift exchange. Because in a beautiful exchange, God gave us the greatest gift of all time in the man named Jesus. And what he allows us to exchange is infinitely better than any present you'll receive this Christmas. Because God gives us the ability to exchange our worry for his peace, our hurt for his healing, and our grief for his joy. Now you know what the next three weeks is about to entail. Today, I'm talking about exchanging our worry for God's peace. Our worry for God's peace. And that sounds too good to be true, right? That sounds way too good to be true, but it's not. Because to follow Jesus means to have supernatural gifts that change our minds, change our hearts, and change our lives. And one of those gifts is what has been described in Philippians chapter 4 as peace that exceeds anything we can understand. Or if you're old school like me, peace that passes all understanding. Peace that exceeds anything we can understand is a promise from God. This is what it says. Paul writes it like this, Philippians chapter four, verses six through nine. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And so, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Who's worthy of praise, Jesus? Verse nine, keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. A peace that exceeds anything that we can understand and let's tell the truth this morning. Let's tell the truth. I bet that most of us in this room are not living in peace that is far beyond what we can understand. I believe that most of us in this room are living a life full of worry and stress and fear and anxiety. And we are in this constant mode of what's going to happen. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I'm worried about what tomorrow holds. I'm worried about my life today. I'm worried. Let's tell the truth. Most of us are not living with peace that exceeds anything that we can understand. And it's because we've allowed our worry to kill the peace that God is trying to give us in life. We're worried about everything, everything. That's exactly what our culture has taught us to be worried about. Our culture is plagued by worry, by fear, by anxiety, and it just seeped into our lives. I'm worried, right? You're worried, we're worried. I'm worried that I'm not gonna be able to support my family. I'm not making enough money at work, so I'm worried. So I, I'm forsaking everything else and I'm, I'm picking up second jobs, third jobs. I'm trying to do whatever I can to make sure that I can support my family because I'm worried. I'm worried that my freedoms and my rights are going to be taken away by the government. And so I fight and I argue and I get in constant battles on social media with people because I'm worried. And I feel like if I don't express my opinion, then it's not going to work out right. And I'm worried. I'm worried that this virus is going to continue to kill people that I care about. I'm worried. I'm worried that my friends and my loved ones and my family members are gonna die from a virus. I'm worried. I'm worried that I'm gonna be forced out of my comfort zone. I'm worried that I'm going to lose the life that I've built for myself and my family. I'm worried that the things that I have acquired and the wealth that I have is going to all fall apart. 
I'm constantly stressed. I'm anxious. I'm afraid. Let's be honest this morning. Let's tell the truth. I'm worried I'm never going to be as successful as I should be. And so I keep climbing the ladder. I keep stepping on people because I'm worried and I'm stressed and I'm anxious that I need to keep doing more so that I can become more because I need to be as successful as I'm supposed to be. I'm worried that people aren't going to like me. And so because I'm worried that people aren't going to like me, I try to become who they want me to be or who I believe they want me to be so that way they'll like me, so that way they, they won't look at me and frown. They'll look at me and smile that they'll like me because I don't want to be unliked. I want to be liked. I want people to think that I'm cool. I want people to think that I'm worth it. I want people to like me. I'm worried that people aren't going to like me. I'm worried that if I don't look a certain way, people will think less of me. So I spend all my money on things like clothes and shoes and, and making sure that I look good so that way people will see me for who I want them to see me as. They won't think less of me. They won't know the truth, and that's okay because I'm worried that if I don't look a certain way, people are going to think less of me. I'm worried that people will find out the truth about who I really am. And I'm worried that if they find out that truth, they're going to judge me. They're going to persecute me. They're gonna make fun of me. And so I can't let anybody get too close. I gotta build up walls. I gotta keep them at an arm's length away because I can't let people get too close. I can't let them know who I am because I'm worried that if they do, if they find out who I really am, things are not gonna go well. I'm worried that I'm gonna be alone forever. I'm worried that I'm at the end of my life and my legacy isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried. We're worried people. We're anxious people. We're fearful people. And when we allow our minds to run free with worry, we are killing the hope and the peace that comes from God. Friends, it literally tears us apart. Did you know that the root word, the old English root word where we get the word worry means to be strangled? It's literally strangling us. Our worry is strangling us. When we allow worry to run free in our minds, friends, it does physical damage to our bodies. Our worry is literally killing us sooner than God intended for us to die. When we allow worry to run free in our minds, it is tearing us apart from the life that God has created us to live. And the truth is that in this broken world, there will always be things to worry about. There will always be things to worry about. There's always going to be situations and circumstances that we're going to be in, and we can be worried about it. But worry does not have to be our reality. Supernatural peace that exceeds all understanding is a promise from God, and he will keep it for those who follow him and put their focus on him. That's called living with a secured mind. Having a secured mind in Jesus Christ. Worry does not have to be your reality. Anxiety and stress and fear does not have to rule your life. Supernatural and divine peace is a promise that God keeps for all of his people. And so how do I exchange my worry for God's peace? How do I secure my mind in Jesus? I'm glad you asked. I have answers for you. There's three things that we can do. Three things that we can do to exchange our worry for God's peace. And they are right praying, right thinking, and right living. Right praying, right thinking, and right living. First one is right praying. Right praying. Friends, we have to pray right. We have to pray right. Well, how do we pray right? Well, we have to have a relationship with Jesus. And the question is, do you know who you are in a relationship with? Think about your relationships with your friends. Do you know who they are? If not, they're probably not your friends, and you're not in a real relationship, right? Because we weren't meant to be immediately intimate with strangers. It's weird to walk up to a stranger on the street and just divulge your entire life story, okay? I've been in those circumstances. I feel weird about it, right? 
But as a pastor, I still stay there and I listen and I talk because that's who I am. But that's not what we were meant to do. We were meant to live in relationship with people who become like family. The family of God. We are all a part of the family of God. And so what is a family? A family is people who love each other and because they know each other and they care deeply about each other. But that takes time. That takes intimacy. That takes vulnerability. And so to know how to pray right, we have to know who we are in relationship with. And if we are not understanding who God is, if we are not constantly and consistently learning who Jesus is, learning who God is, friends, we are not living in right relationship with him. In the uh, other side of the same coin, if we are not allowing God to know who we are in the intimate and vulnerable places in our lives, then we are not allowing him to have a right relationship with us. Right? Psalms, the entire book of Psalms and all of the ones contained in there that David wrote are him expressing his feelings, his doubts, his fears, and everything to God. He is allowing God into the most intimate and vulnerable places in his life. Why? Because he understood who he was in relationship with. Understand, friends, God is not afraid of your doubts. God is not afraid of your fears. God is not afraid of your anxiety. As a matter of fact, God is the healer of all things. God is bigger than it all. Your worry, your doubts, your fears, your anxiety, your stress has to bow in the presence of God. So why? Why would we ever choose to withhold the truth of who we are and what we are going through from our Father? Why would we ever choose to withhold the secret places in our lives that we are afraid of people knowing about from God? It's because we don't understand who we are in relationship with. And when we don't understand who we are in relationship with, we can't pray right. Because right praying isn't just God, I need you to do this for me. It's not just coming to him with a list of things that need to be done and saying, God, I need you to get these things done. And if you don't, I'm never coming back. A right relationship with God teaches us that he is above all, he is greater than all, he is the most powerful name above every name on this planet. And so in our adoration and worship and submission to God, when we begin to have a relational conversation with him and tell him about all of the ways and the things that he has changed in our lives and all of the ways that we are worshiping and glorifying and magnifying his holy name, he then in those moments begins to inhabit the praises of his people, right? That's what the Bible says. And so in our our prayers it says that we can come to him and pray about everything telling him what we need and thanking him for all he has done when we understand who we're in relationship with we'll understand how to pray and when we understand how to pray we begin to open the door to God's peace in our lives the second thing we can do the second thing we do to exchange our peace, or excuse me, to exchange our worry for God's peace, is we have to think right. We have to live in right thinking. So here's my question for that. Do you know who our God is? Do you know who Jesus is? Is your mind remembering the promises and the truths of God? Or is your mind focused on the things that are causing you stress, anxiety, fear, and worry? Friends, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, for a child is born to us. We live on the other side of Christmas. We live on the other side of the Bible. We know exactly who that child is. His name is Jesus. Let's move forward. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called, listen to this, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince 
of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who our God is? He is the almighty God creator of all things who breathed in, in, into dirt and made life come into existence. He spoke this world into motion. That is the God who stepped down out of heaven into the flesh of a man named Jesus Christ, incarnated himself so that we could have a relationship with him. Do you know who your God is? Do you know who Jesus is? He is the mighty God. He is the miracle worker. It is his words that can speak and across the, the uh, excuse me, across the countries a girl can come back to life. He is the one who can touch a, a, a man in a moment and he can come back to life. He is the one who can speak and sickness has to leave the body. He is the miracle worker. Do you know who our God is? He is the prince of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Friends, he is Emmanuel, God with us. That means that he is here right now with you and with me. Do you know who your God is? I grew up in Ankeny. Some of you know this. I've told this story before. And uh, growing up in my neighborhood, uh, there was this little kid. His, uh, his name was Dylan. And Dylan was a few years younger than, than me and all my friends. And uh, we had this kind of mantra, this kind of saying, you mess with one of, one of us, you mess with all of us, right? You mess with me, you mess with the whole trailer park. It's how it worked. And Dylan was in fourth grade. We were in eighth grade, me and all my friends. And uh, we found out that Dylan had been getting uh, picked on at school because he lived in the trailer park. He'd been getting picked on at school. He'd been getting beat up at school. He'd been getting, and he didn't want to go to school. He hated going to school. And he told all of us this one day. And so the next day, me and all my friends, there was like seven or eight of us, we skipped school. And we went to school with Dylan. And when we walked into school with Dylan, this boy who had been picking on him, who was bigger than him, stronger than him, more powerful than him, stood there, looked at Dylan, and then looked at us. It was in that moment I began to explain to him the truth about who Dylan is. Dylan is one of us. And so if you continue to pick on Dylan, you're gonna have to have a conversation with us. And from that day forward, Dylan had the best school year of his life. But the same thing goes with God. Friends, we have to think right. We have to remember who is standing in our corner. We have to remember the power that is shot up in our bones, the life-giving power of Jesus Christ through the presence of his Holy Spirit. Friends, do you not remember that he was asleep? This man, Jesus, was asleep in the boat with his disciples. And at a word, the storm calmed. But recognize that the miracle, in my opinion, is not the fact that his words can stop a storm. Storm. We recognize that God breathed into dirt and life came. But the miracle in that moment that he was trying to convey to his disciples when he said, why do you have such little faith? Is not that my word can calm a storm. It's that my presence will get you through the storm and you do not need to worry about it. Friends, we have to remember who is in our corner. We have to remember who we follow. We have to remember who our God is. We have to focus our mind right. Do you not remember the story of a man named Daniel who stood in front of a government who told him, you're not allowed to pray to your God. And he said, I refuse to stop. I refuse to stop. And it was in that moment that they threw him into a lion's den. But in the moment of peace and confidence, Daniel spent the night staring down lions and his God kept him safe. Do you not remember the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Three Jewish boys who understood who their God was. 
And so they decided, I will not bow to some created idol. I will not bow when you tell me to bow. I will stand on the promises and the truth because I know who my God is. And when they stood, the king said, it's time for you to die. And I love this story. This is my favorite Bible story of all time. I love this story. Because when they were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, he began to talk to them. And the boys responded. The boys responded with this. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, they said this. Excuse me. I'm going to read all the way through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Why? Because they had peace and confidence in who their God was. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have have set up. Friends, do you know who is standing in your corner? Do you have the peace and confidence of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because we know what happens next. They were thrown into a blazing furnace that was heated seven times hotter than it was supposed to be heated. It killed the guys that threw them in. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was standing there, and the king saw what looked to be the son of man walking around in the fire with them, and they walked out without even a singe on their hairs. Friends, you got to begin to think right and remember who is standing in your corner. Because peace is a promise that God keeps. Peace is a promise that God keeps. I love that story because the boys weren't worried. I love that response. We don't need to defend ourselves. We don't need to have a conversation about this. I'm not worried because the God I know has the power to save me. And even if he doesn't, everything's going to be okay. Friends, when you begin to remember who's standing in your corner, when you begin to remember that the common denominator in all of those situations is the fact that God's presence was there and they were in his presence, you know, you know, I don't need to worry. I don't need to be afraid. This may be the craziest storm I've ever faced in my life, but God's got me. As long as I'm following him and I'm focused on Jesus, he's got me. Everything's going to be okay. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Friend, we have to think right. We have to think right. Supernatural peace in the middle of circumstances that cause fear, anxiety, and worry is a promise that God keeps for all of those who would put their faith and trust in him and follow him with their lives. Faith and trust and follow Jesus and you will have peace. Where's the team you can come? The last thing that we have to do this morning is we have to live right. To exchange our worry for God's peace, we have to have right living in our lives. And here in a moment, here in a moment, you can see these white cards down here on the altars and the communion table. Here in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm going to give you an opportunity to exchange your worry for God's peace. So I want you to be ready for that. But friends... I want you to know that we not only have to pray right and live right, or excuse me, think right, but we also have to live right. We also have to live right. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. The work of righteousness will be peace. You know what that means? That means you can't just believe, you have to live it out. You can't just know that God is real. You can't just know that God is the God of peace. You have to live in his peace every single day. So my question for this is, does your life, the way that you live today and every day, does your life prove that Jesus is real? Does your life prove that Jesus is real? 
is real? Do people see you doing the work of righteousness and living in peace? Do the people that you encounter at your workplace, at the store, in your neighborhood, do they know that Jesus is real based on the way that you live your life? Because we know what the Bible says. The Bible says that you can't just be hearers of the word, you have to be doers of the word. And James tells us that faith without works is dead. That you can believe all you want, but if you don't live it out, if you're not carrying the good news of the gospel of peace to those in this broken and dying world, if you're not living it out, friends, it's worthless. It's all worthless. We have to live right. We can't just experience the peace of Jesus within us and keep it to ourselves. God's called us to do better than that. God's called us to live better than that. You and I have been mandated by Jesus to reach out to a lost and broken and dying world and shine the light of Jesus Christ. And it tells us that as you begin to live, as you begin to work out your righteousness, there will be peace. There will be peace. We cannot separate external action from internal attitude. If we truly have peace within us, then we should be peaceable people on the outside. And that supernatural peace of God inside of us, when we live it out, it will draw people to the God of peace. Does your life draw people to Jesus or does it push people away? We have the opportunity to shine the light of peace. If we're going to exchange our worry for God's peace, we need to begin to live out what he's called us to do. So this morning as we close, I believe that there are people in this room that need to exchange their worry for God's peace. Some of you this morning may need to make peace with God before you can experience the peace of God. That's salvation making peace with God, that is salvation. Recognizing that there is a chasm separating you from God. And so when you choose to surrender your lives and come with a peace offering to God, you make peace with God, just like you do with somebody else that you have a problem with, that you have a separation with. When you wanna make peace, you come with a peace offering. Thankfully with God, we don't have to come up with that on our own. He's given us a peace offering in his son, Jesus. And so when we are ready to approach the throne room of God, when we are ready to approach our father, Jesus is with us. Because he died for us so that we could have peace with God. So this morning, right now in this moment, if you're here, could, could everybody just close your eyes and bow your heads with me in respect of people around you. This morning in this moment, if you're here, and you would say, Pastor August, I need to experience that salvation. I need to experience peace with God. I've never experienced that before. When I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand and I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he cares about you. Three, he wants peace with you. So if that's you, raise your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Let's pray. Father God, I pray with all those people in this room that just raised their hands saying that they need to make peace with you, that there is something in their lives that is separating them from you. There's a chasm and it's called sin and it is keeping them away from you. God, I pray that right now in this moment as they surrender their lives, that you would bring them peace, that you would show them how much you care about them, how much you love them, how much you care for them. You would show them the life that you have created them to live. God, I pray right now in this moment they would begin to ex experience an overwhelming feeling of your presence. They would begin to experience the overwhelming truth of who you are right now in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just clap for the people that received salvation this morning?
I have one more way that I want you guys to respond because like I said, if we're telling the truth, all of us in this room have something we're worried about. All of us in this room have something that is causing us stress and anxiety. It's, we're losing sleep over it, we're afraid. All of us in this room have something that's causing us to worry. So my challenge to you is this, I'm gonna give you a moment. There's uh, little index cards in, this, in the pockets in front of you, in the pew backs in front of you. There should be a pin somewhere around you. What I wanna challenge you to do this morning is this, is I'm gonna give you a moment to write down the things that are causing you worry to write down the things that are causing you stress and anxiety, to write down the things that are, that are ripping you apart on the inside and keeping you from the life that God is calling you to live. I'm gonna give you a moment to write those things down and then I will come back, I will pray for us. And then my challenge to you is this, to bring them down to the front to drop them on the altar and then to find a place in the altar and exchange your worry and receive God's peace as we sing a song, okay? I know that that's uncomfortable. I know that I'm asking you to step out of your comfort zone, but I believe that when we physically do something, right? We cannot separate internal attitude with outward action. When we outwardly and externally do something, we begin to live right. We begin to live out what God is asking us to do. So I'm challenging you to drop off your worries on the altar and then find a spot down in this place with hands raised to God and say, I receive your peace. I surrender the things that are causing me stress and worry and anxiety and I receive your peace. Take a moment right now before we start to sing to write down all the things that are worrying you, that are causing you stress and anxiety and causing you fear. Father God, I pray for every person in this room. I pray that in this moment, they would begin to surrender the things that they are worried about. They would begin to surrender the things that are causing them stress and anxiety and fear. And that God, in a moment when they bring them down to drop them off on the altar and they find a spot to surrender and receive peace, that God, that's exactly what would happen. They would begin to receive your peace. They would know and feel that you are with them, that you are taking care of them, that you are still in the boat with them, and that you are taking them through the storm. And so God, I pray right now in this moment, as we begin to respond to what you are doing and we exchange our worry for your peace, Every person in this place would know how much you love them, how much you care about them, and that peace is a promise that you keep. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you wanna respond this morning, please feel free as we sing this song to drop off the things that you're worried about on the altar and find a spot to worship Jesus. And peace is a promise that God keeps. Peace is a promise that God keeps. This may need to be a daily practice for you to surrender your worries, to surrender your anxieties, to surrender your stress, your fear over to him and receive his peace. Remember, as we spend time in his presence, this isn't just, his presence isn't just here in this moment, it's with you every single day. If you follow Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in your hearts. His presence is with you every single day. He's still in the boat. And he'll carry you through the storm. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for the ways that you're speaking, the ways that you're moving. And God, I ask that as we go out this morning, that we would walk out of this place in peace and we would recognize that even though we are facing a storm, even though we are in the middle of the fire, God, you are with us and you love us and you care about us and you are carrying us through with peace in the middle of the chaos. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Everybody said.